Hello, mind mappers, and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over Indistractable by Nir Yal. Now, this book is going to be perfect for you if you are a distractible person. If you find yourself checking your email at all hours of the day, if you're distracted by social media feeds, or heck, even if you're on this YouTube video procrastinating from something that you should probably be doing. I recommend that maybe you go and actually do that thing if that's you, or perhaps you watch this video and use some of the techniques that I'm going to show you in order to get back at it. So let me quickly introduce Nir Eyal. You might know him. Uh, he's actually an author of a book called Hooked, which is a really great book around marketing and around creating a product that people are going to want to continue to use. He's also a former lecturer at Stanford's graduate school, and he's been writing for a quite a long time different articles and et cetera that have been featured in the Harvard Business Review, Time, The Week, Inc., and many, many more. I recommend that you go and check out his website or check out some of his writing on Medium. He's just a really great writer about very, very important things. Now, Nir might not necessarily really agree with a lot of the things that Cal Newport is saying, but... I think they talk a lot about about the same things. So if you're interested in Cal Newport's writing, you should definitely stay tuned for this book. Let's talk about Indistractable. The first quote that I pulled from the book to give you a general overview of what we're going to be talking about is, the fact is that in this day and age, if you are not equipped to manage distraction, your brain will be manipulated by time-wasting diversions. And in the next few pages, I'll reveal my own struggle with distraction and how I, ironically, got hooked. But I'll also share how I overcame the struggle and explain why we are much more powerful than any of the tech giants. As an industry insider, I know their Achilles heel and soon you will too. Now, I think this is a very interesting point for two reasons. Number one, he is an industry insider. He knows a lot more about these things than most other writers would. So he really is the perfect person to actually write this book. And number two, it's very interesting because I think a lot of the books that are written about, a lot of the dialogue that is around some of these big tech companies is that they are inherently bad and want to hook us on their products and will only lead to detriment. And I think that really Nier is going to take a completely different view of this and show us how we're much more powerful than we think and than we've been led to believe and show us how we can use these amazing technologies for good in our lives and the lives of others. Continuing on with his quote, he says, the good news is that we have the unique ability to adapt to such threats. We can take steps right now to retain and regain our brains. To be blunt, what other choice do we have? And that's absolutely true. Most of these tech companies are not going to be going away anytime soon, so we may as well learn how to utilize them and not let them distract us. We don't have time to wait for regulators to do something, and if you hold your breath waiting for corporations to make their products less distracting, well, you're going to suffocate. In the future, there will be two kinds of people in the world, those who let their, let their attention and lives be controlled and coerced by others, and those who proudly call themselves indistractable. By opening this book, you've taken the first step towards owning your time and your future. But you're just getting started. For years, you've been conditioned to expect instant gratification. Think of getting to the last page of Indistractable as a personal challenge to liberate your mind. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. What a great quote. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Planning ahead ensures that you will follow through. With the techniques in this book, you'll learn exactly what to do from this day forth to control your attention and to choose your life. And just a quick side note, I know you're not actually reading the book here, but think of the same thing as getting to the very end of this video. There's not very many people in the world who are willing to watch an entire summary video that's going to be 20 to 30 minutes long on a particular topic that they know is going to be self-empowering, self-improving, and all about personal growth. So take this as your kind of goal moving forward to watch all the way to the end of this video and any other personal growth videos you're looking to take in in the next few weeks. So let's talk about this. Are you being manipulated by time-wasting diversions? Now, if you listen to most of the media, you probably think, yeah, for sure, I am and so is everyone else. I think, as Nir says, you if you aren't, you're probably an outlier, right? Being an industry insider, Nir has a first-hand look at how big tech has crafted their platforms to be time-sucking, addiction-creating machines. And you can see that even he is going to talk about a little bit about how he 
actually got addicted to these things and how he was constantly being distracted by his devices. But it's also a great relief that we have access to someone like him who can help us navigate this new world. How much time are you and your peers wasting? Well, people I've worked with and um, have coached have used time tracking spreadsheets. We use this all the time to see how much money they're making based on the amount of time that they put in. They can find a good hourly wage. It's really important for entrepreneurs. But a lot of them found that they might be wasting up to 10 hours a day. Now, those were the top people who were getting extremely distracted at all hours of the day. But some of the top performers, even the people that were really high level, found that they were wasting six hours a day. And if you think about yourself, how much time are you wasting? Are you on YouTube all the time? Are you on social media all the time? That type of thing really adds up. And six hours over a full year is almost 2,200 hours. Because And that's a really really scary amount, 2,200 hours. The contents of this book are really going to change your life because if you think it's too strong a statement, think about the 10,000 hour rule. By adopting some of these techniques, you might be able to claw back even just half of that time, go from six hours to three hours, which is over a thousand hours a year. Meaning in 10 years that you could be an industry expert in any new chosen field. That's just crazy. Some of you might just have a similar story to Nier where he was spending just a little bit too much time on tech and not with his family, which is something even more valuable. So whatever place you're in, whether you're looking to get more out of your life in some sort of professional field and etc., or you just want to spend more time doing the things that you want to do and less time sucked up by the tech giants, this book is going to be perfect for you. And with that, we'll get into our mind map overview. If you're new here, you'll know that these main topics are the main action points that I think are coming into the book. The two blue ones are the ones that I recommend that you stay tuned for because those are the most important points. And if you want to get the most out of this mind map, you can do it by following along. You can find the process of how I mind map, which is a step-by-step video guide that takes about 15 minutes for you to learn to mind map exactly like me. And all 50 plus mind map templates, which is including this one, all at the link down below. Follow along, we'll help you learn more and remember better and apply these books to your life. With that, let's get into our first kind of big idea of the mind map, distraction. And really what this one's going to talk about is the difference between traction and distraction. I bet many of you probably didn't even realize that traction was a word that would apply to our lives. Imagine a line that represents the value of everything you do throughout your day. To the right, the actions are positive, and to the left, they are negative. And you can see that I have this model played out here in in the photo. On the right side of the continuum is traction, which comes from the Latin trahire, meaning to draw or to pull. We can think of traction as the actions that draw us towards the life that we want. And you can see that down in the diagram here. Traction on the right-hand side are actions that move us towards what we really want. On the left side is distraction, the opposite of traction. Derived from the same Latin root, the word means the drawing away of the mind. Distractions impede us from making progress towards the life that we envision. All behaviors, whether they tend towards traction or distraction, are prompted by triggers, internal and external. Those are two of the main things that we're going to be talking about here today, is triggers both internal and external and how they relate to whether we're either distracted or whether we're in traction. So what we're talking about here is the opposite of distracted. So many of us feel distracted, but we don't even know that there is an opposite. In one of the interviews that I listened to with Nir, he actually pointed out, he's like, you can't be distracted if you don't have something that you're distracted from. And what an interesting point. Nir has pointed out here that there actually is traction, doing things that move us towards what we really want. That means that distraction isn't just about surfing the internet. It's actually the act of doing things that move us away from what we really want. It could be so many different things. He talked about an experiment where he actually did a digital detox, which is um, something created by Cal Newport. He did the digital detox, but instead of getting all this valuable productivity that Cal says that you might get, He actually ended up being distracted about the same amount of time, whether it was reading magazine articles, whether it was reading uh, books, whether it was going outside for a hike, whether it was fixing something at his house. He continued to be distracted even though he eliminated the tech. And I think that's a big part of this book is 
it's not necessarily about eliminating the tech, although it might be about that, it might be part of it, but it also is about managing these internal and external triggers that lead us more towards distraction instead of traction. That's what we're going to talk about today. A great question to ask yourself is, why, if you find yourself distracted, why am I choosing distraction over traction, over doing the things that I want to be doing? And oftentimes, it's because traction can be difficult. It can be stressful. It can be fear of failure. There can be mental energy that it's going to take up in the brain just doesn't want to burn those calories because it doesn't perceive it as being a benefit to you. And really, because of all of these things, there's no wonder why we tend towards distraction. It's interesting to think about how we can create the optimal environment for distraction, right? So after all, the to are the tools really what's causing the distraction? And as we talked about before, likely that's not really the tools. Or are the tools just really feeding into something that we actually want? Are they making it easier to be distracted? Or are they giving us something to do while we want to be distracted? Because make no mistake, being distracted is a choice. You are not addicted to those things by way of um, not being able to stop. They are not that addictive. And we'll talk about that in a little bit uh, on the main point about willpower. But really what we're getting at here is the root cause of distraction. Consider the game of pool. What makes the colored balls go into the pocket? Is it the white ball, the stick, or the player's actions? We understand that while the white ball and the stick are necessary, the root cause is actually the player, right? The white cue ball and the stick aren't the root causes. They are the proximate causes of the resulting event. And I think once we have that all kind of laid out, you see where we're going here. In the game of life, it's often hard to see the root cause of things. When we're passed over for a promotion, we might blame the cunning coworker for taking our job instead of reflecting back on our lack of qualifications and initiative. When we get into a fight with our spouse, we might blame the conflict on one tiny incident like a toilet seat left up, instead of acknowledging the years of unresolved issues. And when we scapegoat our political and ideological opponents for the world's troubles, we choose not to seek to understand the deeper systemic reasons behind the problems. And this is really happening everywhere in our lives. We're looking at, instead of, we're looking at the proximate causes instead of the root causes. Continuing on with quote, he says, these proximate causes have something in common. They help us deflect responsibility onto something or someone. It's not that the cue ball and the stick don't factor into the equation. Or in other words, it's not that the technology doesn't factor into the equation just like the coworker in the toilet seat, but they certainly aren't responsible for the outcome. Without understanding and tackling the root causes, we're stuck being helpless victims in a tragedy of our own creation. That's very important, understanding the root causes, and that's what we're going to be getting at today. The distractions in our lives are the result of the same forces. They are proximate causes that we think are to blame. While the root causes just stay hidden, we tend to blame things like television, junk food, social media, cigarettes, and video games. But these are all the proximate causes of our distraction. So what is the root cause? Given that all of these things that we normally blame for our distraction are the proximate causes, they're the ball in the stick, what is the root cause? Well, it's really the same as the actual cue ball analogy. The root cause is us. Surfing the internet, scrolling on social media, and watching YouTube are all the proximate causes. Again, they're the ball and the stick, and they are what we see as the problem, but in fact, they're just a symptom of a deeper underlying problem. So let's talk about it. What is that problem? Well, Nier calls in the book these internal and external triggers. Specifically, we're talking about here the internal triggers. And really, it's just the inability to deal with any type of emotional discomfort. Some examples of these internal triggers could be boredom. Well, if you're bored, you might go out and surf the internet. If you're uncertain, you might spend hours on YouTube trying to look for the answer. If you're lonely, you might start scrolling on your social media feed. These internal triggers could be different for any of us. So, and b b even the trigger and then the proximal cause could be completely different for each of us. Some people, boredom might lead to overeating. Some might lead to surfing the internet. Some might lead to a healthier coping mechanism of going outside and walking and etc. But what it all really comes down to is our inability to deal with this emotional discomfort. 
And that spending a lot of time on social media, spending a lot of time distracted and procrastinating our work is not necessarily a product of the environment, but the environment is the proximal cause is the proximal um, event that happens rather than us actually dealing with the emotions inside of ourselves. And that's something that we could talk about at great length, but it's something that you should definitely take some time to think about. You know, why am I feeling distracted? Am I feeling bored? Am I feeling uncertainty? Why am I tending towards this distraction? And how can I allow myself to deal with these maybe negative, painful emotions in a way that doesn't take away from my life and doesn't lead more to distraction? Now, the next point we're going to talk about here is willpower, and this is very controversial. Uh, willpower is something that we've talked about quite a lot on the channel already, and we've often heard that willpower is finite, but we're going, to, we're going to hear something a little different here in this book. Recently, however, scientists have examined the theory that willpower is finite more critically, and several have soured on the idea. Evan Carter on the University of Miami was one of the first to challenge Bowmeister's findings. In the 2010 meta-analysis, a study of studies, Carter looked at nearly 200 experiments that concluded that ego depletion was real. On, upon closer inspection, however, he identified a publication bias in which the studies that produced contradictory evidence were actually not included. When factoring in their results, he concluded that there was no firm evidence that's supporting the ego depletion theory. So, the ego depletion theory is essentially that early in the morning you have more willpower and then later throughout the day you have less willpower and that's kind of just uh, taken for granted nowadays people believe this right he says furthermore some of the more magical aspects of the theory like the idea that sugar can increase willpower have been thoroughly debunked and it's so interesting because so many books have actually been written on the cornerstone of this ego depletion things that are telling you to get up early in the morning and get right after it and etc. But how many times have you heard that willpower is finite, that you can only make so many difficult decisions in a day? It seems like it's stated in literally every wake up early book and every, every different habit change book and etc. Well, waking up early might still be a great way to get a lot done. It's not necessarily for the reasons that we initially thought, because willpower is simply just not finite. It doesn't drip out of a bucket as the day goes on. Well, except for one people, not, in, not included in this quote is actually where he goes in and he says, it actually does work for one group of people. And it simply is the people who believe it. It's a complete pl placebo effect. So what does that mean for you? What you need to do is stop telling yourself that you have a finite amount of energy, a finite amount of willpower, because it's simply not true unless you think it is. It's the amazing power of the mind. Instead, what you can try is thinking about the fixed versus growth mindset that we talked about in Carol Dweck's book, Mindset. Think, I don't have the ability or energy to do this now, but eventually I will. And today I can take a step in the right direction. Because taking too many steps can definitely be very stressful. It's not necessarily de depleting your willpower, but it is causing you a lot more stress. A great way to think about it is taking one step or two steps towards solving a problem for tomorrow. And that's a great way to use the fixed versus growth mindset in order to get yourself to be constantly moving forward, which is, of course, what the human animal generally wants. Now, our next blue point is make time. Now, this one is very, very, very important. Probably the one that if you were going to get anything from this book, this would be it. Whatever our values may be, it's helpful to categorize them in various life domains. A concept that is a thousand years old, the Stoic philosopher Heraclitus demonstrated the interconnected nature of our lives with concentric cir circles illustrating a hierarchical balance of duties. Now, that was quite a mouthful, including the name, but essentially what he did was he placed the human mind and body at the center and followed by close family in the next ring. You can think of this kind of like a bullseye and then extended the family, the fellow members of one's tribe, and then the inhabitants of one's town, fellow citizens, countrymen next, and finishing with all of humanity in the outermost ring. Inspired by his example, I created a way to simplify, simplify and visualize the three domains where we spend our time. Number one is you, 
Number two is relationships. And number three is work. These three domains outline where we spend our time. They give us a way to think about how we plan our days so that we can become authentic reflection of the people that we want to be. And this is all about becoming that, becoming that authentic reflection of the person who you want to be. Does your calendar reflect your values? Because if your calendar doesn't reflect your values, then your daily actions don't reflect your values and you can never really become the person that you want to be, that authentic reflection of who you know you should be, who you could be. Now, we know that the opposite of distraction is traction. And that means that if we're to live life less distracted or live life less uh, moving away from who we want to be and more moving towards who we want to be, we simply need to make time for it. There are a lot of applications and techniques of doing this, including just a simple calendar. Check out Nier's website for a lot more different scheduling apps, and he even has his own kind of calendar in there as well. But here's an interesting point. What should we make time for? If we're going to start calendar, uh, using a calendar and et cetera, what are the most important things that we should be making time for? And what kind of hierarchy should we be putting them in? Now, Nier gives us these three topics. He gives us the three most important things. First is ourselves. Second is our relationships. And third is our work. How are you creating time for yourself? This could be quiet time. This could be exercise. This could be just taking time to do self-improvement like you're doing right now. Next, how are you creating time for your relationships, the people around you, your friends, your family, your significant other? How are you scheduling and creating time for those people? Finally, one that most of us have uh, already down, how are you creating time for your best work? Spending time actually going after the things that you want to accomplish rather than kind of reacting to what everyone around you is asking you to do. I think that this is very, very important, that this is actually a hierarchy. First, you need to make sure that you're scheduling time in your calendar for yourself. Because, as we all know, if we don't take care of ourselves, we're not going to be able to take care of the people around us, and we're not going to be able to create our best work. Number two is your relationships. Those are the things that are the most important in your life, much more important than work for the majority of us. Are you scheduling time with those people like you would schedule time with a client? And most of us are definitely not scheduling time outside of our work commitments. So very, very important. And then within your work commitments, are you scheduling time for your best work? Are you scheduling time for deep work? Are you scheduling time where you're not going to look at the external triggers so that you can make sure that you're spending all of your attention on the things that you know that you want to create? Something I see all the time with my clients is almost inevitably when I work with entrepreneurs, this section is completely flipped. The most important priority is work and then the relationships and finally themselves. How are you possibly going to bring your best to all areas of your life when your values are flipped in the wrong direction? Often when I work with these people, they don't even have a schedule. They just allow things to come at them. And this is the absolute worst thing that you can do. Quite simply, you will not make time for exercise unless you plan it. You have to plan that exercise out. And ideally, you're going to have a trigger that's going to make you get to the gym or do whatever type of exercise you like to do. You will not have healthy relationships during hard times unless it's a habit. So unless you're scheduling date night, unless you're scheduling time to look into each other's eyes, unless you're scheduling time with your friends to actually have healthy and fun conversations and etc. And you will not create time for your best work unless you set aside some time for it. You have to make sure that you have a, a time on your schedule that is only for your best work. It's not, no one else is allowed to interrupt you. So, so, so important. I recommend that you check out Deep Work. I recommend that you check out Turning Pro. I recommend that you check out So Good They Can't Ignore You, all by Cal Newport and Stephen Pressfield are such good books. You should definitely check those out. Now, our second last point here is about hacking back. So the quote goes like this. In 2007, B.J. Fogg, founder of Stanford University Persuasion Technology Lab, taught a class on mass interpersonal persuasion. Sounds very interesting. Several of the students in attendance would later pursue careers applying his methods at companies like Facebook and Uber. Mike Krieger, a founder of Instagram, created a prototype of one of Fogg's apps in his class. 
So as a student at Stanford's business school at the time, I attended a retreat at Fogg's home where he taught his methods of persuasion in, in more depth. Learning from him firsthand, I was turning a turning point in my understanding of human behavior. He taught me a new formula that changed the way I viewed the world. The Fogg behavior model states that for a behavior, B, to occur, three things must be present at the same time. Number one is motivation, number two is ability, and number three is trigger. More succinctly, B equals M-A-T. Motivation is energy for action. According to Edward Dicey, professor of psychology at the University of Rochester, when we're highly motivated, we have a strong desire and the requisite energy to take action. And when we're not motivated, we lack the energy to perform a task, and most of us know this intuitively. Meanwhile, in Fogg's formula, ability relates to the facility of action. Quite simply, the harder something is to do, the less likely people are to do it. Conversely, the easier something is to do, the more likely we are to do it. And you're probably noticing this is sounding a lot like Atomic Habits by James Clear, another book that I recommend that you check out. When people have sufficient motivation and ability, they're primed for certain behavior. However, without the third critical component, the behavior will not occur. A trigger tells us what to do next and is always required. We discuss internal triggers in a previous section, but when it comes to the product we use every day and the interruptions that lead to distraction, external triggers, stimuli in our environment that prompts us to act, play a big role. So as we talked about before, we, we have already gone over these internal triggers. But now, how can we use external triggers and how can we make sure that Big tech isn't using external triggers in order to co-opt our motivation and our action and therefore our behavior. Well, what external triggers are you currently paying attention to? See, big tech wants you to pay attention to their triggers. They want you to pay attention to the push, no push notifications, email notifications, the texts, and all that sort of thing. They want you to pay attention to those things simply because their number one revenue source is our attention. They understand that in order to get you to do something, they need to give you a trigger. But we can also use this to our advantage. See, tech isn't all bad. Some of those applications are actually addictive to our lives, additive, sorry, additive to our lives. But what is bad about them is controlling our actions instead of us controlling them. So essentially, some of those things like YouTube is a great resource. Some different social networks are a great resource. And so many different things are really great resources. But what ends up happening is they have really hacked into this idea of a trigger. And they've gotten so good at creating these triggers that we continually take the behavior that they want us to take, which is staying on the platform and staying distracted from our true work. And we need to make sure that they aren't able to give us these different triggers to continue hacking our actions. So that's where we start hacking back these external triggers. So turn off all the non-essential notifications on your smartphone. If you haven't already done this, you should do this right now. Don't leave email or IM open 24-7. That's just ridiculous. Block the websites or application that are easily distraction when you won't be using them. So for example, you could use the self-control app on Mac, which I'm actually using right now to block some of the websites that I might be tended to, towards distraction for. Those are all simple things, including you can do so many different things. There's so many different things that you can uh, use. And we'll talk a little bit about where you can find all of these applications at the very end. But really what we're doing here is how can we use this BMAT to our advantage? First, we have to hack back these external triggers. And then once we know the BMAT formula, we can use it to our very own advantage. So think about how the formula works. Could you find a way to get a higher level of motivation? Maybe you can think about your vision a little bit more. Maybe you can set more concrete goals. So many different ways to get a higher level of motivation. Can you find a way to become more competent? Maybe you can take a little bit of a course. Maybe you can uh, get someone to actually coach you through something. Becoming more competent is going to make the things easier for you to do. And finally, what triggers can you set up to get you started? For example, for me, Every day at 9 o'clock a.m., right after I've had my coffee, right after I'm coming back from my hike with my dog, I turn my egg timer to 50 minutes, and that gets the day started. 
I get 50 minutes of really deep work in right away. And because of that, that's my trigger. I end up working all the way through the day. So, so important to have a trigger to get you to start taking action on the things that you want to be doing. Now, our final point is final level. Very interesting point, but with that in mind, what identity should we take on to help fight distraction? And again, this is going to start sounding a lot like Atomic Habits again. It should be clear. It should now be clear why this book is called Indistractable. Welcome to your new moniker. By thinking of yourself as indistractable, you empower yourself through your new create identity. Now, essentially what we're doing here is doing the opposite of what we talked about in our willpower point, where willpower only drains for the people who believe that willpower drains. Essentially what we're doing is we're turning ourselves into these indistractable people. We're taking on the identity of the indistractable people. And that's going to cause us to be a lot less distractible. And we're going to choose to do things that are a lot less distracting. You can also use this identity as rationale to tell others why you do strange things, like meticulously plan your time, refuse to respond to every notification immediately, or put a sign on your screen when you don't want to be disturbed. That's one of the things that you could do in the book that I decided not to include in the mind map, but it's an interesting thing. Um, he has this sign that he gives you with the, with the book. You can kind of print it out, and you can put it on your computer screen and tell people, hey, you can't distract me right now. Come back an another time if you work in an office. Interesting thing. These acts are no more unusual than other expressions of identity, like wearing religious garb or eating a particular diet. It's time to be indistractable and be proud of it. So many of us are feeling like we're kind of going into the, um, th what other people are doing. We're just kind of following along, and all of us are distracted. Well, if we want to be wildly successful, if we want to be the type of people that are going to be able to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish, we're going to have to be okay being different. And this is one of the ways that we're going to have to be different. Identity is a powerful way to change your habits. As James Clear says in Atomic Habits, the key to building lasting habits is focusing on creating a new identity first. And that's essentially what Nir is showing us here. Create the identity of someone who isn't distractible. Identity packs are a way to train your identity, and it's a great way to go about it. He says in the book, by making identity packs, we are able to build the self-image that we want. Whether the behavior is related to what we eat, how we treat others, or how we manage distraction, this technique can help shape our behavior to reflect our values. Though we often assume our identity is fixed, our self-image is, in fact, flexible and is nothing more than a construct in our minds. It's a habit of thought, and as we've learned, habits can be changed for the better. So, how can you set up your life so that your identity is related to the habits that you want to create? Simply by creating a pact. And there are many different ways that you can do this outlined in the book. Again, we'll go over that in our final, final note. Pact, a formal agreement between individuals or parties. So essentially what you need to do is create a formal agreement between you and a few other people in order to get yourself to stick to these habits. So for example, YouTube channel and coaching. This is what I do. One of the reasons that I started this YouTube channel is because I wanted to read more, but I could never get myself to continue reading or at the very least have real information to take away from the books. I would quite often forget everything that I read, but by creating this pack to create one video a week, I'm ethically forcing myself to be the person to adopt the identity of the person who creates these videos and therefore reads these books. Content creation is a great way to create a pact, and once you have an audience expecting content from you, you're much more likely to do the work and do it more vigorously. It's been an amazing experience, and I want to thank you guys all for being in a pact with me. This is hacking your motivations, as we've talked about in the BMAT formula. And I suggest this to a lot of my coaching clients where they just start a blog, start a YouTube channel, do something, and who even cares if people watch it? But if they do, great. If they don't, it's kind of whatever. It's more about creating the pact with yourself and creating the pact with the three people that watch your content so that they know that you're actually going about and doing the work. Quick final note, there are a lot of apps and other tech recommendations in the book. You can find all that stuff on Nier's blog at nearandfar.com. I also really recommend that you pick up the book because this one has actually changed how I go about my day-to-day -day life. So I think that's really important. And if it can change my day-to-day -day life where I like to think of myself as someone who has read a lot of these books about deep work and flow and takes it relatively seriously. And he gave me some information that could change my life. I know it will help you as well. So I recommend that you check it out.